been looking forward to this discussion today for a long time, literally almost three years, we've been trying to get members of the uh, Documentary Producers Alliance here on the D Word, because we're like a bunch of producers here, whether we want to or not. And many of us don't want to be producers, but we have to be producers. So um, you have this great organization working on your behalf, but many of you don't even know it exists, much less what it does. So um, we're bringing in Erica Taylor and Steffi Venry from the DPA to um, explain it all to us and to um, um, kind of talk about some of the initiatives they're doing and particularly um, ones that are are new that actually haven't even been announced to the industry yet. Um, we're going to do a little bit differently today. Normally, I would just have a discussion with them for the first hour or so and then open it up to questions. But today, I want to make it a little bit more interactive. Um, and as uh, as we're talking, if you have a question, um, use the raised hand. And if it seems kind of organic at the right moment, I'll try and uh, bring your question in or even a comment because like we're all producers here. Um, so with uh, also, I just wanted to say that I'm going to be coming at this. We have a lot of emerging filmmakers and producers with us also. So I want to um, come from that angle a bit. You know, so if some of my questions like, what is the DPA? And what, what do you guys do? What does a producer do? I, you know, I mean, that's part of, I think I know what a producer does, but I, I, I want to keep in mind um, people who are, um, a lot of our members actually come from different backgrounds, really interesting professional backgrounds, usually in some form of media or coming to documentary. So also trying to keep them in mind, but, um, Anyway, Erica and Steffi, welcome. Um, first and foremost, like, please introduce yourself briefly. Uh, uh, Erica, I mean, you're both producers, so let us know a little bit about that and what you do um, with the DPA in particular. Absolutely. So just introducing myself, my name is Erica L. Taylor. Um, I'm currently located in uh, St. Louis, Missouri right now, which is the home of the Dred Scott decision, uh, a slave who unsuccessfully sued for his freedom. And uh, it's so interesting that you said that, Doug, that you know we are all producers and I don't think we're producers necessarily by choice because yes, it is a calling to do documentary production, especially as everything that we have to go through, we're definitely called to do this work. Um, so I definitely want to acknowledge that as well. And I also want to say hello to any DPA members that are attending the session today. Please feel free to say hello in the chat. Um, we love to see your presence and, and acknowledge you here. Um, so yes, yeah, so I am uh, the Vice President of Board of Directors for uh, Documentary Producers Alliance. And I'm also serving um, as the co-chair of the Equity and Inclusion Subcommittee. Um, I'm also working with our Producing Toward Equity uh, program, uh, which is a joint program with IDA, which I can definitely get into more of that in the future. Um, but you know, I, I don't want to continue going on without Steffi giving an introduction of herself. So um, I will throw that to Steffi first. Thank you so much, Erica. And thank you, Doug, and the D-Word for having us. We're also very excited to be here. And Erica will tell you a lot about the organization at large, but I will just say that we're only two faces here representing, but it's such an amazing organization. So hopefully everyone who hasn't heard of us will be a bit more excited and looking into some of the work we've done after this. Um, but yeah, I'm calling in from New York. Um, I'm originally from Amsterdam, um, but I've been living here for about eight years, working as a documentary producer. Um, I joined the DPA during the um, pandemic, which was both a horrible time and a good time to join, um, lots of extra time. Uh, so I started working on, at the time we had um, a social committee um, running the social media with some of um, the fellow DPA members. And I'm currently um, part of the ethics subcommittee. So that's why I'm here today. I saw that um, Lisa Lehman and Sarah Wainio are both here. They, they are our co-chairs for the um, ethics subcommittee. 
And then I'm particularly working with Sarah and four other amazing members. I think maybe Simon Mendes is here too on the ethics resource library. So I'll be talking about that a little bit today too. Great. Do you wanna like shamelessly self-promote a little bit uh, some of the films you've uh, produced or worked on? Um, sure, thank you so much, Doug. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm foremost a documentary producer and I work both on features and on series. Um, and I've been lucky to work with a lot of amazing filmmakers. Um, I've worked a lot with director Cynthia Lowen, who's fantastic. And we just did a film, Battleground, about um, the fight for reproductive rights. So that was quite topical. Um, I've worked on a series about NASCAR's um, only Black driver, Baba Wallace, that's on Netflix, called Race. I'm the supervising producer of a series set in Minneapolis post George Floyd with um, police officers who are also high school football coaches seeing what they do. That's called Boys in Blue and working on a number of amazing projects now. So I'm lucky to do this work and happy to be here with you all and talking about producing. Great. You are busy, busy, busy. Erica, anything else you want to mention that you're working on or? Uh, yeah, you... yeah, sure. So um, I, uh, my first film was uh, entitled The Invisible Vegan, which is on Amazon Prime about veganism in the African-American community and our understanding or misunderstanding of it. And my current project is entitled Red Alert, The Fight Against Fibroids, which is a, actually a personal documentary about the struggle that Black women have with uterine fibroid tumors, which is an, an, a huge epidemic among African-American women and also African women. Um, and we are about 65% through production for that, so. Great. When um, one of you isn't speaking, if you wanna put in links, uh, actually, um, uh, Julie, we have, you have links to their, um, their web pages. Um, so we'll put that in the chat and uh, if people want to find out more about you and your work, they can, they can do that in their spare time. But right now they're listening intently to everything you say. Um, so for those who are not familiar with DPA, um, can you give us some background? Um, what does it do and wh why, why was the need? I think it, it formed in 2016 um what was the impetus for it why did you guys feel there was a need for a collective organization of producers absolutely so you're right uh dpa was formed in 2016 informally by a group of producers who really wanted to build a bridge of sustainability between the industry and documentary producers as i mentioned you know earlier doc producers are we we tend to travel the road less traveled and so um, we have a, a larger lack of resources um, and recognition in the industry. And so the DPA really set out to help to not only open that conversation, but um, find some remedies for those specific issues in the industry. Um, we are 500 producers strong now. So, and that is worldwide ranging from, you know, producers who are emerging to Academy Award winning uh, um, uh, producers. So we're really grateful and thankful to have that range of uh, producers available within our membership. Um, our membership has also grown uh, just even this, this past, uh, in 2023, we've had 136 new members. So uh, shout out to everyone who is uh, spreading the word about the work that we're doing and that we're continuing to do. Um, but we are a co-op where we um, set the standards for inclusive and sustainable and equitable business practices based on research, collective experience, and input from strategic partners. Um, our goal is to amplify the voice of doc producers worldwide. So, you know, we do that through educating the industry about our essential, the essential role that producers play from areas like development all the way through financing, production, and distribution. Um, you know, long story short, we want to amplify the voice of producers. We want producers to, you know, be heard in the industry. We want their issues to be heard in the industry and addressed. Um, we're, we're definitely hoping to, um, impact those issues, you know, like finances, 
um, and sustainability, which I think is probably at the top of the list for most doc producers because you have this wonderful idea, but how are you going to finance it? What resources are available to you? And then you find yourself in a, a large pool of producers who you know, may be vying for the same grant opportunities and things like that. When you go on set, do you know, you know what to ask for when you're asked to work to, on a project? Um, you know, do you have all the tools that you need when you're you know, addressed with, um, with an opportunity um, in the industry? And so the DPA really hopes to uh, not only just train, but also to you know, educate um, our members, um, the hiring, the gatekeepers. We want to open up those that dialogue with the gatekeepers to um, make them abreast of all the issues that you know many of the, the producers are facing. So uh, we do that, uh, you know, like I mentioned, through a co-op and collaborative experience. Um, we are a majority volunteer-run organization. We uh, do have a couple of staffed members. We just hired a communication strategist who will be joining us next week, and we're really excited about that. But um, we are really dedicated volunteers uh, comprised of a board um, and an executive committee and a membership body. And we all really collectively work together um, to you know, tackle those issues within the industry. Um, we really you know, want a vibrant, just, and sustainable field for nonfiction producers. Um, and so in doing so, we have developed some tools um, that are available online through our website, documentaryproducersalliance.org, um, one of which I know the industry uh, has commended us for, which is the crediting, water, crediting guidelines, um, our waterfall guidelines, and then also our contract negotiation guidelines, which will be released um, uh, in the next couple of months that we're really excited about. Um, so I can go into detail with those later if you wish, or, or if we have questions about it, but um, and, and also, you know, can share those where those are located on our website as well. Um, by the way, speaking of educating, do you think you could educate film critics to recognize that producers on documentaries actually exist? And I, that is our goal as well. We we definitely, you know, and, and I'll be honest with you, uh, upon joining DPA, I I did not realize where we were basically on the uh, priority list in the industry as documentary producers. And being in this community of producers, I'm, I'm learning more about the attitudes uh, that the industry has about doc producers, nonfiction work. And I was shocked. I was like, oh my gosh, because I hadn't reached that level yet where I was sitting in the audience or, or, or I was uh, waiting to, uh, for a nomination to happen yet. Um, and so learning these things, you know, I was shocked and I said, oh my gosh, how can they not think that what we do is not important enough for, you know, invitations to festivals or invitations to the award shows or to be recognized in credits. I just, I was shocked by that, you know, knowing everything that we put into our work as producers and how we come up with these stories and how we, we you know, take the road less traveled and we are the voice for the voiceless. And so I was a little shocked by that, you know, I, I was very shocked by that. Um, and so it only fueled my fire personally to want to continue to amplify the voices of, of doc producers through the DPA. I think we need a slogan. Producers, first ones in, last ones paid. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's real, Doug. True. <laughs> <That's more> stickers. <laughs> <laughs> I will say there was, I, I, I'm trying to remember, but I want to say it's maybe two years ago, the DPA was doing a producers are filmmakers too campaign and really helping to push the film festivals to, yeah, inc include producers in credits and making sure that like often we have to buy our own tickets, you know, to our own films at a festival. So things like that to really shine some attention on it and then hopefully help move that needle and make people understand like what we do and why it's important to yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. And there's one, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, Doug. Um, oh, no. But you know, no. even speaking as, you know, documentary producers being on the broad spectrum underrepresented in the industry, then you've got the conversation about, uh, you know, those from marginalized communities, uh, producers of color, disabled producers, producers who are LGBTQIA plus, uh, all these diff different groups of producers who are, you know, also straining for resources to get their projects done. So it's a layered effect, you know, when it comes to the lack of recognition and the lack of resources. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it goes across the board. 
you know, the Academy Awards, I think only two producers are allowed up to get, you know, or, or officially recognized as producers of the film, even though there may be more. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I see the Tony Awards and like there's 50 people going up to accept the statue. So, um, uh, you know, I wonder if part of this doesn't stem from, the, you know, uh, and this goes to your crediting guidelines you know, of executive producers and the confusion over what an executive producer does versus a producer. You know, there was this original thought that, you know, oh, they're the ones that help get the money or bring the money. And it's mostly in that there's some very creative executive producers, very experienced ones. And then there's, of course, the celebrities that add their name and maybe not much else but a tweet, perhaps. But um, you know, so I, so tell us a bit about the crediting guidelines, because I think, I think that's been a really, really valuable one for producers in terms of trying to figure out, you know, how much financing or that they bring in is worthy of an exec producer credit, what the order of exec producer credit should be where you know the minimum amount should be given you know what what do you give for somebody who wants to donate five thousand dollars and how does that you know impact somebody who might want to give you know 10 times that amount sure i mean the crediting guidelines um you know they are really critical you know to the work that we do um i was recently um blessed to be at the austin film uh, doc intensive, uh, Austin Film Society doc intensive, and presented the crediting guidelines to um, a group of um, filmmakers. And, you know, there were multiple questions about, oh my gosh, I, you know, told my participant they could have this credit. Um, should I not have done that? Um, and so, you know, these are like really common questions that, <clears throat> excuse me, producers come across. And so, um, we developed the crediting guidelines to help to try to tackle a lot of those issues. Um, I can go ahead and share my screen to kind of give people an sure. idea of where, where the crediting guidelines are located and just kind of give a quick uh, glance of, of what those look like. So I'm going to... Yeah. And Julie, you could put the um, link to the crediting guidelines in the chat, if you would. It's always exciting with a share screen. Uh, please. Em, are you guys waiting for me to do something? No, um, no, no. I'm, I'm no. sharing my screen. It's okay. Okay, great. Thank you. But if you could put the link, Julie, to the, yes. uh, yeah, that'd be great. So upon visiting the DPA's website, which is, again, documentaryproducersalliance.org, um, visitors will see, you know, any open letters that we've presented um, uh, talking about any issues that were relevant. Um, in the, in the uh, doc producing space worldwide, um, and also a description of the DPA. Um, but then you'll find all of these different documents that uh, our members have, our volunteer members have uh, put together. Um, back in January 2019, we specifically created the crediting guidelines. And uh, that was before my time with DPA, so shout out to those uh, uh, some of the other founding members who put this document together, which is so crucial um, to doc producers. But uh, the crediting guidelines is really a great tool for producers to understand kind of how the credits should um, appear uh, or how they should be uh, in their projects. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna try to get to a specific section here. We've got a lot of pages. So this kind of gives an overview of the crediting standards um, and, and kind of help people understand how the financial track works with, um, with, uh, uh, with the different producer credits. Um, like for instance, we have the financing credit tiers, you know, getting 50% or greater, what type of credit that is, 20% or greater, 
you know, that's the in, in association with credit, 10% or greater, ex one executive producer credit, but it goes on to explain these types of different producers. Um, I believe the last time I presented this, I want to say that there were over 30 different types of producer credits that were possible that I didn't even realize existed, and I'm sure a lot of people don't as well. Um, but it also, this in combination with the waterfall guidelines gives you an idea of uh, who gets paid and when, um, you know, you, you receive monies for your film, or you receive any type of um, uh, distribution monies for your film, who gets paid first, who gets paid last, and a lot of times people don't realize what order that should come in. Um, that's where, you know, definitely the waterfall comes in, but when you're considering credits and who should be assigned those credits, then, you know, you definitely want to use this uh, document as a guide. Um, we also want to make people realize that these are just guides. Um, a lot of times, you know, as struggling producers, we may have, you know, one producer doing several different jobs on a set um, or holding several different titles. So it's important to recognize that as well. And also for budget reasons, when you're doing your budget, you know, and you may have one producer that's doing, you know, uh, or one, one, one producer doing several positions, um, how do you handle that on the budget? How do you handle all those different job titles on the budget? So, you know, this just really gives a guide to that um, and kind of demystifying it, especially for emerging producers. And even some mid-level uh, career producers have said that this is a really awesome document. And I've got to tell you, some advanced producers who've done many films find it invaluable too. Um, it's particularly helpful to go um, to be able to explain to a potential financier what the credit is and why and why they're you know what they're thinking of donating it's you know here's this organization that's laid down the guidelines this is the bible now for um that we can go to and it's it's just enormously helpful so it's it's really not just for emerging producers yeah absolutely absolutely so we really encourage people to visit these different documents on the website um, a, it gives a better understanding of what the functionalities of each producer role is. Again, it is just a guide. Um, things can be altered, you know, on your set. Um, but we really want to try to make um, a lot of these principles uh, have continuity um, on sets, which we think will help in the long run with the industry really understanding more about the role of producers um, in filmmaking. So. I'm just curious, uh, Erica or Steffi, um, has the DPA um, helped define where profit is? Like what, where, 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 because that, you know, in terms of um, producing, one of the important things is to have an understanding or agreement with your producing partners, you know, when you decide you're going to share profits or you bring people in, you have to know where does profit begin um, and where does, you know, the budget itself end? Um, so have, have you guys, you know, considered that or, um, or where do you just stand personally on it? I mean, well, that kind of, I, I think is also explained in our waterfall guidelines. Yep. Um, I think that that's, that's a really awesome tool to help understand how that payment goes and, um, I'll be happy to, you know, share that as well. Um, yeah. And I, I will just add that I think a lot of that, um, these guides are a really good starting point, right, to have these conversations with your team, because I think that's often the case is that every project is shaped a little bit different, as you said, Doug, Doug too, like sometimes there's multiple producers, sometimes there's not, so that all, all goes into it, of course, um, and so I think having even just the sort of glossary of terms like oh this is what this kind of producer does or this is what may come if you are a funding producer and you bring in this much money um even for our own teams it's helpful to have these conversations around like i i just am working with two um first time filmmakers now who've put together this amazing investor document for people who are interested in investing in our documentary but are completely new to it um and and we've actually used these um crediting tiers that we just saw 
on the screen ourselves. So they're in the document. So not only are they explaining like, here's what profit may look like in documentary. And if we're being honest, like often there is none, right? I will, <laughs> I will just be honest about that reality, but um, it's been helpful for them in talking to new funders, but also for themselves to see like, how are other people doing it? Absolutely. And just referring here to the waterfall guidelines, um, this, I believe, just goes hand in hand in the conversation. This really gives, you know, a glossary of terms for producers when it comes to investing, investors, um, how those should be handled, how we should look at those when it comes down to um, distribution and uh, the budget. Uh, let's see, I'm going to try to get when you receive funds for your documentary, how do those funds get distributed to you know, different um, levels of, uh, of crew um, when you receive things like cash advances? Um, what does that mean for your project? Um, these are all things that are discussed in the, in the, the waterfall guidelines that um, are available to, for reference right on our website. Does, does, do, do the waterfall guidelines um, discuss what a producer should um, pay themselves? What what percentage oh. of the budget, perhaps? Sure. No, the waterfall guidelines don't get into that. However, I'm glad that you mentioned. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, we have, for the past almost three years, I think, been working on the contract negotiation guidelines, um, which are a really important tool for producers to understand um, negotiating their contracts when they um, go into uh, a project or they've, a project's been introduced, or perhaps if they're you know, doing a project themselves, um, things that they want to keep in mind when it comes to uh, paying other uh, crew members. So it's really a tool for producers as they consider and define working relationships with rights holders. Um, we're currently targeting releasing this early next year. Um, and, and really looking at the most effective way to roll this out to the industry. Um, but it, it provides best practice recommendations for a work for hire documentary producer to evaluate a project, establish a good working relationship with the rights holder and formalize an agreement and ensure equitable compensation. Um, and, and this is all done with the goal of creating a, a sustainable career. Um, it provides some background information, including an overview of the intended audience, um, clarification of the roles and responsibilities of producers and rights holders, and some notes on some legal and business entities. Um, so we really took a really uh, uh, fine-tuned look at this document, uh, putting it out just, again, as, as a guide. Um, but it also lays out a series of steps from initial consultation and project evaluation through a trial period and negotiations leading to a full contract, which should outline fair compensation on an agreed upon schedule, the scope of work and other considerations that define the producer's rights and responsibilities. Um, then there's a section focusing on sustainable compensation outlines um, and approach that focuses on sustainable compensation outlines an approach to codifying minimum compensation levels with the recommended minimum rate table as a starting point for negotiation. Um, and, and the rate table, I will tell you, Doug, is, you know, we really put a lot of thought into that. Um, a lot of our members, you know, had collaborative um, uh, commentary on the rate table. So we really wanted to make it fair and sustainable and just um, for the producers. Um, you know, additional topics that are covered in the guidelines include compensation in relation to budget increases or decreases, premium rates, and reasonable accommodations for delays in payment due to cash flow issues. Um, we've had to also, you know, look at this, you know, thinking about inflation that's happening. Um, that was something I know that came up uh, as well. Um, and then finally, a resource section will be in the guidelines that includes a discussion topic for vetting the project, questions for vetting the rights holder abbreviated exp explanatory definitions of standard contract clauses, a, a glossary, and links to other DPA guidelines. Um, this will all be available um, from our, our DPA website. Um, so we're looking forward to releasing that uh, hopefully soon and doing a rollout at various festivals and other events that are industry specific. And, and first and foremost to our members, of course. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of curious, um in these guidelines, there, there's so many in the documentary field who are producer directors. 
and how you separate out the directing from the producing in these in these kinds of guidelines. I mean, we've we've had um, uh, sessions with like I'm thinking of with Robert Bahar where we went over budgets and that was obviously a question that came up there. But is there any way to address guidelines for you know hybrids? I mean, you know, <laughs> director, producer, camera persons. You know, um, we just so many jobs that we multiple jobs that we tend to have. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a conversation that has come up recently. Um, we're seeing more of that producer that we do have that slash, um, uh, that multi-hyphenate title um, is becoming more common, especially, you know, speaking from, you know, my standpoint, my view as a, um, as a producer, a doc producer, you know, my project, I do have the title of producer director. Um, and so, you know, I, I just kind of look at it as responsibilities, but my identity is producer. Um, you know, I'm not sure exactly how, you know, the industry would look at that, um, you know, so I, I think that that's really, um, it's a larger conversation to be had that we are starting to have now as more producers are um, having that multi-hyphenate title. Uh, I can't tell you that we've done something to truly address that at this point, but I do know that we do know that it is an issue that's existing. Um, and it's something that I think that people are finding themselves having to do also because they don't have the necessarily the resources to pay, you know, a larger crew, you know, when it comes to their projects. And so it's, it's really a larger conversation about sustainability and being able to, to get the resources in for our projects that we need. And also maybe a conversation about a living wage. Um, I know that there's been, you know, uh, uh, conversations had um, in, in certain states and also among, you know, the industry about producers um, nonfiction producers getting a living wage while they are producing. Um, so that's a much bigger issue that I think uh, also involves some legislation as well. Um, but but it speaks to the fact that we have more producers that are taking on multiple titles as well. I don't know, Steffi, you have anything to add to that? No, I, I think it makes sense. Like there, there is that hybrid a lot, right? And we, I think as an organization, definitely do focus on those who are producers first um and so we're coming at it from that from that um point of view but i do know a lot of our members too wear multiple hats and especially in doc documentary it's just so common yeah absolutely and um and, and doug if you don't mind i i see a couple of questions over here that i just want to address really quickly yeah absolutely although i do want to add um folks use the raised hand function and um we will bring you on we're, we're not going to just wait till the end of this discussion and have a q a um really at any time if you have a question use the raised hand sure so just i see someone asked about the pay transparency project dpa was um, in alliance with Brown Girls Doc Mafia in uh, working on the pay transparency project. So we are part of that as well. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, I see that there's someone has put a link in the chat, but it allows people to record a, they're, they're basically their wages for um, and their rates for the work that they've done so that we can kind of look at that uh, as a scale to see, uh, you know, where where, where the range is for different um, crew positions, different producer roles, and uh, really document that and see where the industry lies, and hopefully use that as a tool to build that continuity that we need. Uh, Chris, we are going to reward you by having you be the first to ask a question. Thanks. Um, my first reward all week. I love it. Yes. Um, just kind of in terms, I guess, from your own personal experience, like what do you look for when you're taking on a documentary project or I guess the percentage, like what are the priorities, like something subject matter that means something to you, where it is and kind of its production timeline, whether you know that a distributor also has an interest in this topic matter, like what are those things that you kind of personally look for when you're deciding to take on a project or is it slowly this is my fee or this is my percentage, can you hit that? It's a great question. And by the way, I want to just add, we have two really great producers with us. So, you know, feel free to ask questions about producing in general, not just sticking to what is the DPA and what do they do? So 
with that. Erica Steffi. Sure, I'll jump in on that. I um, I think it's always a mix of different things, like some of those, those considerations that you mentioned. For me, I think the two um, biggest ones are always, yeah, the subject matter or the story, and then uh, the team on the other hand, because I think we often kind of joke that, especially with producers, directors, it's it's a bit of a marriage, right? So you want to be working with people you really like because there's oftentimes it, it takes years to make films. There's a lot of time spent that isn't, I'm not even sure how to say this, but it's like, you'll get a call really late from someone and it better be from someone you like working with to help them through something that, you know, obviously is about the project and has to do with the film. Um, but it, there, I think there's so much more than the responsibilities that people think of, which, you know, will be like funding or crewing up or strategizing. But then there's that part of, you know, the pers personal aspect that I personally really like about this work is like you get to work with people, but that also means obviously you want to work with people you like. Um, and then I think same way that uh, directors will often have a sort of niche or, you know, particular work that they're interested in. I think a lot of producers have that too. So I personally like to focus on stories um, about women's issues, about social issues, and really look for the kind of projects that I wish like someone would be making, right? So then I can either wait for it or I can help go and, and make these films that I wish were out there about topics that I care about. So that that's kind of it for me. And actually, you know, I pretty much have the same answer as Steffi. Um, you know, when I think about the work that I've done, um, it's always spoken to my personal skills. Um, it's also always spoken to issues that were really important to me. Um, I mentioned early on that the work that I'm doing now um, is a personal documentary on a health issue that I've struggled with for 15 years. Um, and so, you know, I know that after introducing that health issue in my previous film, um, I knew that this was the, the project, the next project that I needed to do. It's, it's almost as if the universe told me um, that this was the project that I needed to do through my own health issues, but also um, because I answered the call of women who reached out to me on social media. Um, my production partner, Jasmine Leva, um, she's in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, she specifically, you know, looks at um, issues that she that she feels very strongly about and introduces me to those issues as well and says, you know, hey, would you like to be a part of this? And, you know, that's how our 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 crew cruise ship is born. Um, but also, you know, looking for people, you know, like Steph, you said, people that you uh, can really vibe with, can you have similar character traits with, because that's really important. As she said, you're going to be spending a lot of time with people early mornings, late nights, you're going to be traveling. So it's really important that you all are kind of on the same page and have the same type of passion for whatever it is that you're, um, whatever the subject matter is that you'll be uh, 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 producing about uh, or doing a film on. Uh, but I think really, honestly, this is a really awesome time, I think, for Steffi to talk about ethics. Um, Doug, I want to, I don't want to overstep your agenda. Oh, no, 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 no. I, 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 <laughs> I will sprinkle the questions in, but I want to make sure we don't get too far off uh, DPA, but yes. Uh, I appreciate the pivot. <laughs> yes, very smooth. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, no, I think documentary is, is one of those fields where ethics come up a lot, right? And um in sort of every step of the process, like from early development all the way through when you're distributing and you're thinking about things like, do I show the film to the people who are in it before we bring it out into the world? Or, you know, how how do we deal um, with when we have heavy topics and, you know, there's stories of trauma, like how do we care for our participants, but also for our team members? So there's so many parts of the project where ethics come up and we don't have a code of conduct um, for ethics in the documentary field. And so um, the documentary um, Producers Alliance started the ethics subcommittee. And I think I mentioned earlier, Lisa Lehman and Sarah Wainio are the co-chairs and they're here. Um, and they really care about ethics. I know they both lecture on ethics as well. And so they said, we're not gonna make a code of conduct, um, but we are gonna, come up with resources and, you know, just gather information and 
help people think about these questions that we're all having and work through them and provide resources. And so one of them is the ethics resource library that I'm working on along with Sarah and for other wonderful members. And what we're really trying to do is just um, make a little library, right? Like, um, there's so many great resources out there that there's not a place for. Um, as I mentioned, Sarah is a lecturer herself and she was uh, lecturing on ethics in pop culture at Fordham University. And she wanted to share some of these resources with her students. And so she figured there must be a place, right? The same way that there's lots of libraries and just good resources where you have anything on one topic. Um, and she found out that there wasn't any. And so then the DPA is such a great place to sort of endorse this work. If, if you're interested in something and it can benefit the field, then um, we often have the opportunities to start a project like this. And so the six of us are um, in the process of just vetting a ton of resources. I know we have um, a suggestion link so that if there's a video or an article you've read that you think is interesting and deals with ethics and documentary filmmaking or just a bit in a larger scale, maybe with journalism or, you know, in a way that um, is relevant to us, uh, us as well, you can recommend it to us and we'll take a look at it. You know, we're doing a lot of reading, we're doing a lot of watching of videos, and then we come together and we discuss like, is this something we think should go into it? Will this be beneficial uh, for other filmmakers, for other producers in terms of making decisions, right? Like, let's say I have an ethical issue. Is this a um, resource that will really benefit? And again, we're not trying to like set any rules or say, this is how you're supposed to do it, or this is how you're not supposed to do it, but really just give people resources and, and options. So we might include something that is about, should we pay participants for being in our documentaries? And we may have something on there that says, yes, you should, and here's how you should do it. But then we may also in include an op-ed that says, well, I don't think we should do it, and here's why. So we really want to just kind of share resources on all sides of these debates. Um, so that's just one topic we may be looking into, but there's a wide range of topics we've come across in our vetting, like ethics of care, um, who gets to tell what story or authorship. I, I think there's been a lot of questions and conversations about that that are very important and long overdue. Um, and so we, we look at all these different issues um, and, Right now, we are working on getting 150 of them vetted and ready to go so that we can launch sort of the initial version of the library in 2024. Um, but as any good library, you know, you always get new books. You see behind me, I'm a big reader. I always buy, you know, you always have that to read stack. So we really want this to be living and breathing. And again, for people to be able to recommend something. I know recently there's been more. Um, articles about the documentary industry because it's growing there's so many of these I think Doug you mentioned even like you know celebrity EPs who are getting into this work and there's just always something going on always something changing so we want to keep up with the conversations and then just kind of on an on ongoing basis bring in new resources and hopefully it'll be um a good place. I, I want to say, I forgot to mention that this will all be free. So we're looking at resources too that, you know, won't be behind, won't be behind a paywall um, and that are just there for you to access and, and hopefully make good use of. Um, I blur my background so you won't see the pile of books. <laughs> no, bye. I have them everywhere. There's like two read sacks or things are noted up and, and this has been so fun for me because they basically get to play librarian, right? Yeah. Um, by the way, uh, Sarah and Lisa, if you want to weigh in, uh, please like use the yes, raise please hand. Please unmute yourself now. and say hi at least. Yeah, <laughs> come on camera. Um, yeah. I know you guys are doing a, a, just a boatload of work on this. So, um, you know, I do want to touch on a, a subject that so much of your work at DPA actually, I, I don't know if you directly deal with it, but clearly when we have discussions about uh, sustainability, you know, men mental health is like a huge issue for producers. Is there anything 
I mean, we're very concerned about it here with our um, documentality initiative. And Malika, I think, is here today to, you know, who could, I hope, weigh in a little bit on that, um, particularly if, if there might be some overlap between what we're doing with documentality and uh, work you might be doing with mental health. Is there anything specifically you're doing to address, you know, mental health and well being of producers? I mean, um, you know, just by having these guidelines, but. I mean, is there anything specifically addressing that? Uh, we don't have any specific initiative at this time about mental health, but we do have ongoing discussions about things like mental health, um, sustainability. Um, I know I mentioned earlier that I am co-chair also of the Equity and Inclusion Subcommittee for DPA. And so we have really riveting discussions in our um, once monthly meetings. Um, and the issue of mental health has come up because you know, when you, like I mentioned in the beginning, you were already an underrepresented group as doc producers. And then you add on those extra layers of being a producer of color or a producer with a disability. And so, you know, when you have all these additional challenges on top of not being able to sustain yourself once you've decided to do this, this film that you know is going to be award winning, I uh, have, you know, and so it, after, you know, a couple of years of working on this project, and you haven't gained any traction, mental health really is um, uh, a hotbed issue that needs to be addressed. Um, it's something that I think we all have to be responsible for uh, collectively uh, as an entire membership body, but also just as producers in general. Um, we have to kind of look out for each other. If we have a set and we know that you know our, uh, our, our participants um, may require you know, any type of um, um, uh, support um, after they've discussed, you know, a really sensitive issue um, for them or a, a or a dangerous issue for them. Um, we know that, you know, we've also we've always talked about having, um, you know, mental health resources on set for our participants. But it's really important for us to really take into account that producers, you know, are struggling. We have struggling producers, producers who have taken on multiple jobs. Uh, in order to sustain themselves while they're working on their films, that might even lead to exhaustion. Um, you know, you're 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 being pulled in multiple directions. Um, you're you're frustrated over a project taking you know multiple years to accomplish, and you wish it was done five years ago, and now it's seven years later. Um, you know, and so it's it's really an important topic that I believe needs to be addressed, um, not even just by the DPA, but also by, you know, other larger organizations out there that, um, you know, that try to, you know, build initiatives for doc producers that are in the nonfiction space. Um, but but we, we, I'll put it this way, we definitely have it on our agenda uh, to do because we know that it's something that's truly important. Um, but within you know the, the equity and inclusion subcommittee, you know, we've had those types of conversations about what it takes to, you know, to, to get our projects out there, what it takes to feel counted um, in a space where you may not necessarily feel like you have uh, a voice. Um, and, and often even, you know, as Steffi was talking about ethics, a lot of time ethics kind of parallels with um, uh, equity and inclusion um, when we're talking about, you know, different projects, what projects we're going to be working on, um, whether or not it is ethical for us to be working on that project, um, you know, and all of those things. But it's really an all-encompassing conversation, but mental health really is, um, and especially for me, really at the top of the list. Um, yeah, Doug, I actually, oh, I so would say that um, Sarah's here, and she knows a little bit more about initiative that the DPA is working on. Um, and on a personal level, I'm just glad you're even asking this question, right? Because I think a couple of years ago, that wouldn't have even been a question that comes up in these types of conversations when we're talking about producing or when we're talking about, you know, documentary work as a whole. So it's just really great to see, too, that people are willing to have these conversations, that they're thinking about, you know, not only the people in their films, but, you know, the people working on the films as well. Um, and so hopefully if we all do a little bit, then things will just get better. But I think if we're able to unmute Sarah Wainio, she can speak a little bit to um, what the DP has got cooking on this issue. Please, Sarah. Hello, everyone. I will just say this very quickly. Um, and Erica wouldn't know about this because it's brand new. We we really we met last night and we're just talking. Oh, oh, I'm big. Hi, everyone. Put, um, put it on gallery view quick. 
Um, for, your, for your mental health and well-being. So just quickly, um, something, and it's very new, so this is within DPA, and right now our membership is working on it, but I would love to extend this beyond our membership, but basically we are working with a New York practitioner um, who approached a mental health practitioner, a social worker who was once in the industry and is very interested in the impact that our work has on all the producers, but also those sitting in an edit room for hours with material or someone out in the field with someone for hours and building years long relationships with folks. I don't need to tell the folks in this room how how unique our work is. Um, so what we were identifying is that there's sort of a desire for a particular mental health practitioner to to give care to people in our industry because if you can jump the line in the sense of not having to educate your mental health practitioner on what it's like to be in the field and maybe not be able to care for your basic human needs like feeding yourself and go into the bathroom at like particular times if you're covering a story in a area of conflict or you know in a hospital there's just a lot of really unique production and documentary production um, situations that some of us were feeling like if we could enter a room knowing that a practitioner already understood, kind of like you can be certified as like a queer friendly practitioner or, um, you know, you work particularly with geriatric folks or very young folks, mm -hmm. we felt like this might be really valuable. So we have just begun to do two things, create a list of what we are calling like film friendly um, practitioners. And then with this practitioner that is New York based, we are also um, developing, which it's going to be, it's going to take a long time because there's insurance and HIPAA complications, but we are working to figure out a way that we can get um, folks in the mental health field like certified basically to have that certification. So right now we have people that we think are already film friendly, and then we are hoping to create um, like a training or a couple hour certification through this professional. The producers will not be doing it, but the mental health professional will help us to create this training where in time in years, and we'll have to figure out each state and all of that mumbo jumbo, um, we can have practitioners that really are catered to the type of work that we do. Um, so thanks for letting me pop in. I don't know. Maybe I'll share, share my email because basically it's very grassroots. The DPA, I wanted to echo something Erica said, which is we are mighty, but we're we're quite small. We're very proud of our 500 members, but we're very new. Um, we just became a 501c3. So we have more ideas than we have bandwidth and we don't want to stop the ideas, but we do need more members basically to get that person power. So I'll toss my email in there. If folks have ideas about this mental health stuff, Malika, um, oh, is it the I, chat? She's a wonder, well, actually, I'd like to, first of all, thank you for your work on this, Sarah, and all that you're doing. Uh, uh, really, really invaluable stuff. Yeah, I'd like to invite Malika to come on camera and talk a little bit about, um, there's so much overlap here with her work, spearheading the documentality initiative. So, um, Malika, do you have a moment? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, wow, what to say? So th this is in no particular like order, so pardon me if it sounds jumbled, but I just put in the chat that um, Rebecca Day, who is kind of my main mental health colleague, who's a therapist in the UK, and her whole practice is documentary filmmakers. So between documentality and Rebecca's work there, um, she is hosting a retreat, I think the first ever retreat for therapists who either work with documentary filmmakers or who are wanting to work with documentary filmmakers. So we are gathering in the UK for three days over Thanksgiving to plan and strategize and share resources, etc. So at least they're like, for, Rebecca and I are already trained therapists, we're already working with filmmakers, but we're at least going to have four more and I know the number will be growing. So Sarah, I would Sarah, I'd love to be in touch with you and your your therapist in the in um New York City. Rebecca and I are also we just finished a training with four staff members from Story Syndicate, who are uh, after after our twelve hour training, we are certifying them quote unquote to be to be peer support leaders for other filmmakers. 
So they are literally, as we speak right now, starting these six month long peer support groups. Um, they've been trained by Rebecca and I, and then we'll meet with these four peer leaders once a month to help support them in their, in their peer support work. Each of them has, has six filmmakers in their support group right, right now. Rebecca's done the same training for filmmakers in the UK and also in Finland. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a way to empower filmmakers to kind of um, uh, support their own peers as they go through, as you all go through this process of working on a film together. But we really focus on developing the facilitation skills of these, of these peer support folks. They're not mental health professionals, but they've done this training with us. And lastly, Rebecca and I also just do a lot of it could be like a one-time conversation. It can be a more long-term kind of consulting with different projects who are wanting to have um, sort of a, um, a mental health professional who can have a bird's eye view of their project work and how they can better support themselves as the leadership team, the participants, the crew. And we haven't gotten much to audience yet, but that is our next step. So there, there's so much going on. And luckily it's not just us but there are so many other folks who are now also getting involved um, and it's just incredibly exciting. And awesome. happy to answer any questions in the chat if you'd like to ask. Well, also you and, and um, Rebecca have done, I think over two dozen focus groups now. Um, yes. And just had some pretty startling takeaways from, from, from those. Yes, we've done focus groups with filmmakers in the UK, US, and Canada. And filmmaker means anyone working on the film who joined our focus group. And actually, we're also working now with Pieces Loud. Stephanie Palumbo is putting together a series of focus groups of just participants. And Rebecca and I will be leading those groups to interview and, and ask participants what worked on the films that they were involved in and also what did not work in terms of harming their own mental health. So. Uh, so Pieces Loud can create some best practices that are going to be free to the entire community, by the way, um, in terms of how directors and producers can support participants' mental health going forward. That will come out at the end of 2024. But they got funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation specifically to do this work around participants. It's just incredible. I've been in this field for two years, y'all, and I have seen this massive explosion of this conversation that I know did not take place, let's say three or four years ago, except for the D word. So it's just incredibly inspiring, y'all. Yeah, you're all doing great work. And I, I hope um, Malika, you and the DPA folks will stay in touch. And, you know, there's just, like I said, so much overlap. And, yeah, I, you know, I use the analogy, you know, we, we're, we're always concerned with the impact we have on our participants and what that'll be like for them, both to be in front of the camera, have their stories told, be so vulnerable in, in such a public way. Um, we're beginning to think about our crews and particularly our editors who might have to look at some very traumatic footage for you know months and months and months. Um, but I go back to the analogy of you know the airplane that's in trouble, you know, and the masks come down, they always tell, tell parents to put the mask on themselves first, because you can't take care of the others without you yourself being well. And I think of um, producers, you know, I, I, I think of that analogy. Um, we'll get back to DPA stuff. There's more to talk about, but I do want to um, let our questioners come in. Mr. Gordon Skinner, one of our esteemed ambassadors. Hey, Doug. Hey, Erica, Steffi. Uh, how you guys doing? Uh, two quick questions. One, uh, Erica, if you could uh, elaborate on some of the work of the subcommittees, certainly equity and inclusion, uh, the curriculum that uh, has been uh, created and that is, you know, make, populating its way through DPA. And also, if either of you can talk about uh, one of the more challenging uh, conversations that's been coming up in DPA about unionizing. Sure, absolutely. So I'll start first with the subcommittee. Uh, so Gordon is one of our subcommittee members at DPA for equity and inclusion. 
Um, and he's one of our more involved members. So we're glad to have really vocal members that come out to our meetings once a month and um, uh, open up discussions about current issues that are affecting our industry from an equity and inclusion standpoint and really talk about their experience. Um, we have producers of different levels having these conversations, so it's really beneficial. Um, and so our conversations, especially with our subcommittee, as Gordon knows, can get uh, pretty exciting. Um, and I don't want to say heated because we all respect one another in a safe space, but they get really exciting because, you know, our producers are really passionate about what they do and how what they do is affects the industry and how the industry affects what they do. So um, we do have, you know, really riveting discussions about um, you know, things that are that are going on um, that might have ethical implications, as Steffi uh, described, um, you know, for instance, we might have a conversation about uh, uh, a, a film that is about uh, a historical Black figure uh, that is produced by a white producer or directed by a white director. And we look at the historical imp implications of that, but also, you know, what that means as the final product is uh, put out, um, you know, what does that mean for the communities that it may, that may be um, uh, uh, representing the viewership for that film. So um, we'll have those types of discussions, um, you know, uh, uh, how different issues that are going on in the, in the world um, are affecting producers, um, you know, whether it may be war or, you know, what have you. Um, we have those types of discussions. Um, we also love on each other. Um, that's the part that I like to say. We, all, we also like to commend um, our members on the work that they've done, give them the opportunity to introduce their work to one another um, and, and congratulate them for, you know, anything that they've achieved um, uh, throughout their career or, or recently. Um, and so we we have these really great discussions for an hour um, in the ENI subcommittee. Um, we also have the Producing Toward Equity program that was um, in conjunction with IDA. Um, and Producing Toward Equity is basically a program that was uh, funded by NEA. Um, and <clears throat> they developed a uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion curriculum that was uh, basically designed to help address DEI issues um, uh, at a critical level and at a really intimate level in the industry and, and among producers. Um, we've had a, a series of successful workshops last year and we continue to uh, receive invitations to present and facilitate this curriculum, which is about, oh, it takes about three hours for us to facilitate this, uh, this curriculum to train um, or, or to uh, introduce this work to, um, to the groups that have invited us out to speak. Um, I personally have helped to facilitate the DEI curriculum in Austin at the Austin Film Society's Doc Intensive. Um, we introduce case studies and let the participants work through those case studies. Um, we also ask those critical questions about equity and inclusion uh, during those sessions. Um, specifically, uh, I remember asking producers um, you know, tell us, you know, instances where inclusion might have been an issue uh, on a set or, you know, where they feel the industry could be more inclusive. Um, and so we like to make this kind of a collaborative uh, conversation and open up that dialogue um, and, and, and help people understand that they're not the only ones going through specific issues. And when we talk about inclusion, we're not just talking about, you know, race, gender, um, uh, we're, we're also talking about, you know, maybe mothers or parents that are on set. And so now we're, we're reopening the conversation too about mental health. And, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, are they feeling, you know, uh, appreciated on set? Are, are people feeling appreciated for their contribution? Um, and we're also talking about, you know, do they feel like the uh, the producer or the director has made concessions for them as parents that may have to, you know, leave to go pick up their kids from daycare. All of these are inclusive conversations that um, we have, you know, potentially when we're, we're, we're doing the DEI uh, facilitation. Um, so that program is available um, by request um, to our Producing Towards Equity uh, program uh, 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 program, uh, I, I'm sorry that the word's losing me, program facilitators, um, but uh, uh, it's available for presentation at any festivals or um, any types of um, program-specific 
uh, film specific events. Um, I meant to mention while Malika was was uh, after she talked that uh, she heads up the um, and oversees the Doc NYC Pro uh, session, the conference that's coming up, uh, which I highly recommend. I also want to mention that the D word will be setting up a special topic, and Julie and um, Nora Puggy will be doing uh, blogging and myself. I'll be roaming around and we'll be doing um, reporting and coverage of those um, conference sessions. Um, Francel. Hi, thanks so much for this. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to uh, how you advise producers um, to meet their, how to be realistic when choosing how many projects at a time to work on it almost seems to me like it would be impossible to have one solution because it's like, uh, is it, you know, three projects at once, as long as two of them are in post and one is in pre or like, you know, like, um, and, and if something isn't at this milestone by a particular date, is it in there in advance that you renegotiate the contract? Um, I haven't, run into issues here, but I could just see it being like the sort of thing where, um, you know, you're relying on a producer, but then that producer uh, had something go nightmarish with another project. And so they have kind of a fire to put out there and how to be fair on both sides of it. That's a great question that I wish I had a really solid answer to, because I think um, as a producer myself, it, it's something I'm still always figuring out, right? I think it's always a juggle. Um, and I think, Frenzel, what you mentioned of projects in different stages, that always helps, right? I'm, I'm working on something that's in very active production, but then also something that is submitting to festivals now, so that the only takes like a couple of hours of my time here and there. Um, so I think that always um, helps a lot and I think the other part um, is just always good communication like these things documentary you never know what's going to happen right we make our schedules we come up with what we think is going to happen or what we would like, like to, to happen, happen and we say this is how long it's going to take, take and then something happens um, and I think one um, hopefully you have good collaborators who are understand the um, who understand that you know, who've either dealt with that themselves or you've set up the, um, just the expectations of, you know, what you can offer at a time. But I think it's always good to revisit that. Um, it's it's good to have these conversations ongoing to just keep coming back to like, hey, here's what my availability looks like for the next month. Or hopefully you'll have other partners on a project so that if you have to step away for a bit, someone else can step in. Um, so it, yeah, I just think good communication will help you through that and, and hopefully um, makes it so that you don't run into those issues. And I'll just chime in and say, and I apologize because my, my internet did something weird and so it froze for a minute. So hopefully I'm not repeating what Steffi said, but just, I guess, from a personal standpoint, you know, you want to think about time management. Um, I know I'm going to make Sarah, maybe a couple of people chuckle on here when I say that I am the queen of taking on too much. Um, and so, <laughs> so I have a tendency to lead with my heart a lot of times and say that I'm available to do um, more tasks and more projects than necessarily my time may allow, but I'll, I'll, I will kill myself trying to do it all and I'll get it done. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, just really keeping in mind, you know, for your mental health, since we brought that up as well, um, to be careful of, you know, taking on too many projects at once because, you realistically cannot give 200%. You only have 100% to give. And whatever um, crew that you're on, whatever project that you're working with, you want to make sure that you're giving 100% to whatever that is. Um, and so, you know, just keep that in mind, I think, when you're, when you're doing that. And I understand as a producer, if someone's offering to pay you for work, you want to try to take on as much as possible. So that's a really realistic way of looking at things. But always just, you know, keep in mind that um, take care of you first, you know. Uh, Simon. Thanks. Okay, uh, Erica and Steffi, uh, thanks for all your insights. Um, so I've got two questions. 
Um, the first question is, as producers, how many documentaries it, can you work on at the same time sort of in general? And, and secondly, uh, your relationships with different directors, uh, how different are they from each other? Yeah. Stephanie, you wanna go first? Sure, I think um, the how many projects questions, it comes kind of back to what Francel was asking about. And I think it, it differs per person and also on the needs of the project. And so sometimes I may have three things at once on my slate, other times way more, other times just one, um, really just case by case situation. So I wouldn't say always go with this number because I just don't think um, that would serve you. Um, and then in terms of the relationships, I, I do think they could differ quite a bit, right? Because um, different directors want, uh, want to collaborate in a, in a different way. And I think for us, it's always, I think a, a big part, um, especially when you're starting out is figuring out how does that work and what does our relationship look like? Um, I think hopefully you work with people who also appreciate your um, skills and your strengths that you bring to the table. I myself come from journalism and I was a researcher for a long time. Um, so I, I like to come in, you know, during development and work with directors on the story, on, you know, researching and on finding the people that we're working with and um, building relationships with our participants together. Um, but some directors may come to you when they're further along and that work has already been done, in which case I'll play a different role and my relationship to the director will be different too in, in that case. You have put down in writing specifying exactly what the roles of each that's are. A, that's a great question. Yeah, I think um, personally, I like to do a lot of that of just, you know, roles and responsibilities so that we know, you know, let's say on a project, I'm the lead fundraiser or I'm, you know, the lead on, yeah, keeping in touch with participants. And that doesn't mean that someone else on the team isn't also working on that, but that means, you know, I keep track of it I'll ask if I need help in that department but so that everyone knows like if I need something on this topic or this part of the process I'll go to this person I think it just helps um I know that um Erica was talking a little bit about the guidelines that are coming out I think a big part of that is like yeah you can put some of that in a contract too right just the expectations and it's just good to be clear on it and and again know that you can revisit them over time it's not set in stone and um, <clears throat> I'll just chime in and say, and, and to answer your your first question, um, my situation's a little different. Um, you know, Steffi's background, she said, was in journalism. Um, my career in production actually started in nationally syndicated radio, and then I went into television docu series, and then into documentary filmmaking. Um, so at any given time, um, I was either working with one director. Um, and, and had a great direct relationship with them, or I was in charge. Um, specifically for the docu-series I worked on, um, non-fiction docu-series, um, we didn't have a quote-unquote director, which was the whole conversation in itself. The producers were in charge of the set, and so, um, you know, from a responsibility standpoint, we were the directors. We did have our, you know, our DPs, but the producers were, were basically, you know, calling all the shots, literally. Um, and so it, it's, it differs, as Steffi said, it differs with, you know, what your experience is. Um, and as far as, you know, how many projects to work on at once, um, it depends because, you know, my model right now looks differently than my last project. So my last project in, in a production capacity, I was a producer on the, doc, the documentary. Um, and so I had very specific producer responsibilities, but as a producer director, as the conversation we had earlier, um, not only am I the producer director, but also I'm, I'm leading impact campaigns and activations before my film is even done. And so I don't really have a lot of time to work on additional projects right now. Um, it's if I do work on a, a project, it may be something contractual, um, you know, that I might just be able to get in and out of in a certain amount of weeks, um, that as we all do wear different hats. Um, but, you know, because of this project and the magnitude of this project, and because I'm also doing impact activation campaigns at the same time, I really can't do, you know, more than one. So it really is, I think, specific to your experience. Okay, it was interesting. Okay, thanks, Simon. Uh, Jim? So this is 
fascinating and wonderful, and I'm delighted about the discussion about ethics and stuff. Uh, my question is, who should and who should not join DPA? Very interesting question. Um, I think that if you truly identify as a director, um, and you may not necessarily associate yourself as a, as a producer more often than not, then DPA is probably not going to be, you know, the best first stop for you. Um, if you are, if you do carry the producer credits and you are interested in exploring more options as a producer, then we would love for you to fill out an application. I did put the application link, um, the membership link in the chat earlier, and I'd be happy to do it again. Um, so uh, those, I think, uh, would probably be, that would probably be uh, maybe the main reason um, that you might want to reconsider joining DPA. Um, like I said, we have members that are have a range of experience. So um, we definitely want to encourage those who may not necessarily carry the credits, but uh, are, are interested in doing more producing to apply because of the, the system that we have devised for membership. And I just, I do want to actually mention that system really quickly um, in answer to your question as well. Um, but in so in 2021, we revamped the entire application process to be a task-based um, process instead of a credit-based process. And the idea behind that was to change, uh, behind that change was to make it much more equitable for folks who didn't have access to credits due to systemic issues in our industry, but were clearly doing the work of producers and likely had been for some time. We wanted them to be able to be able to be uh, in the collaborative, the the, the um, in the in the organization and be able to have a, a voice um, with us as well. Um, so you know, I I would definitely say you know if if you haven't really gotten your feet wet. And you know, you you really don't know if you're interested in getting into nonfiction work. Then maybe you might want to uh, refer to some of the resources we have on the website first, um, and, and look at those and see if working in nonfiction um, filmmaking is for you. Um, but if you have you know done some work and and you like to be able to have a community and be able to you know talk to people and maybe network, then definitely DPA is for you. We definitely want to encourage you to apply. Um, we review the applications once a, once a month, and you know, like I said, this year we've welcomed 136 members, and we're looking at growing exponentially in the next year, especially after re releasing more of our our uh, our guidelines and posting them out publicly. Yeah, I, I'd also say if you're on the fence, um, just join your member. Your membership dues help support the organization and their absolutely. And I'm glad, Doug. Thank you for mentioning that as well. And I also want to uh, let you all know that we have a pay pay what you can option. Um, that is also part of our um, mission to be uh, equitable and inclusive um, for producers who cannot pay um, these specific membership dues that we're asking at uh, the different levels. We do have a pay what you can option. Um, Issa, you asked a couple questions in chat, but you have your hand raised, so why don't you just uh, ask them now? Hello, can everyone. You, uh, my uh, name can is. Can you uh, get on camera, Issa, or or is that not possible? Um, it's not possible because I'm actually at a client's house at the moment. Okay. But my, my question okay. is, um, so I have shot a couple documentaries. I have one in distribution, uh, and. But I've not been able to join the produ the producers guild because of the dues. Um, is that something that we can actually? Does that help if we join your organization or no? Um, you mean does it help you to get into the producers guild? Yes. Does it help, or uh, you know, or is this just like more independent and? Sure, yeah, so we are an independent organization in our own 501c3. Um, maybe I, we do have members that are part of the PGA, um, so there is some networking available there. If you wanted to get more information about the PGA, you're welcome to, you know, uh, fill out an application and, you know, maybe, you know, talk to some of our members who are part of the union. Um, you know, you're definitely encouraged to do that, but we are totally independent of the PGA. And we have had, uh, as, as Gordon mentioned, and, and thank you for saying the word union, because that reminded me of the, the second part of Gordon's question that I did not answer, um, is that we are having conversations about unionizing uh, from a labor standpoint, not 
the DPA unionizing, but we are offering educational tools about union work um, through a different speaker series, a six-part speaker series that we're offering to our, um, our members now. So um, hopefully, you know, if you decide to, you know, fill out the application and it's approved that you'll be able to join us in that speaker series uh, before it ends. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Karen, before we get to your question, you know, you bring up something that I wanted to uh, get to because on on the um, the website, it's, it says originally founded to advocate for producers whose role was misunderstood and chronically underpaid. The DPA's work allowed us to realize that the issues we're facing were not due to professional our professional failures, but to systemic ones larger than um, ourselves. So I'm curious if this is a systemic failure how do we change the system i think you know it starts from the inside out uh, we've got to open up those dialogues that that dialogue about the issues that are facing nonfiction producers and we've got to first identify those issues once those issues are identified then we've got to you know typically what we do is we put task forces together if we decide to do something actionable in dpa which is a smaller subset of people who are interested in doing um some type of initiative, um, whether it be for membership or something that will invite people outside of membership to discuss. Um, and we, our hope is to not only open up that conversation with those gatekeepers, but also do something about that issue. Um, you know, we haven't got to the point where we're necessarily pushing legislation, but we are trying to make that impact with you know, people who belong to even larger organizations that have an impact, like, you know, if it's Sundance or IDA um, or, or, you know, anyone, you know, affiliate with Tribeca, with people who have, you know, a more amplified voice um, who have been in the industry longer, we hope to open up that conversation so that those actionable items can be addressed, um, you know, as a whole. I think that we're stronger in numbers. So as DPA grows, our voice will grow, our impact will grow. Um, and so I think that, that that's really where it starts is really identifying those issues, getting, um, uh, uh, figuring out ways to tackle those issues through the task forces and, you know, really um, fo focusing on um, uh, not just our membership, but really the industry as a whole and how we can, we can work together on eradicating those systemic issues. Okay. Um, we're butting up against our end. So, Karen, last question. Unmute myself. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question is: I you said you go, um, you look at applications once a month. I'm very interested in the October 24th meeting, but. It, when do you look at them? If I filled out an application today, would that um, would you be looking at them this month or is it already too late? You know, I actually would have to ask someone from our membership committee unless Sarah, if Sarah knows when exactly they look at those applications, I'm not sure. Sarah, if you do know, please put it in the chat um, or if there's someone else here from our membership uh, subcommittee, if they could put that in the chat as well. So honestly, Karen, I apologize. I do not know that exact date that they look at those applications. Um, I don't know if it's the beginning or the end, um, but we can find that information out for you, as Sarah just mentioned. Um, and I think that um, Sarah did put her email in the chat, but if you did not catch that, you are more than welcome to email docproducersalliance at gmail.com. And um, our wonderful coordinator, Annalise, will answer that question for you. So before we call a, a wrap, um, I just want to check in with you both to see if you have any final words, um, anything we didn't discuss that um, you wanted to mention. Uh, let's see. Steffi, I'll start with you. And <laughs> I'm the worst for wrap up thoughts. So I, I will just say thank you, Doug, for having us and everyone for joining. It's really nice to see that, you know, people are interested in having these wide ranging conversations about producing, but then everything that comes with it, right, from ethics to to just the nuts and bolts of it. So really, really appreciated being here. And thank you so much. You're quite welcome. And I would like to add that, you know, we're 
this is a really exciting time for DPA. We are you know, really working on our organizational structure and making it really strong so that we are prepared when our membership continues to double and triple. Um, our board is a really dedicated board, an elected board that um, you know, is represented through, uh, we have different representatives throughout you know, the regions in the United States um, and also at large <laughs> overseas. Um, and so we, we really work collaboratively to, you know, listen to, you know, our the needs of the industry to make sure that the foundation is strong for DPA. As a result of that, we're also about to do a rebrand of our new website design um, and, and our entire, you know, stylescape of DPA, um, which will include a member database and forms for workshop and panel engagement. Um, you know, if anyone has any questions about that, they can also reach out to us at coordinator at documentaryproducersalliance.org. Um, in addition to that, we're also doing some really exciting data research with findings from our census that we hope to share in the future.